In my previous magisterial lectures, I said many times that the global climate emergency is upon us. We are already experiencing the impacts and it will only get worse. But are we helpless against climate change? Are the worst scenarios inevitable? Should we just give up and do what we can to prepare for what is to come? The good news is that the impacts of climate change are not written in stone. We can still win against climate change. The bad news, we are running out of time. As a global community, according to the scientific consensus, we only have nine years by 2030 to implement measures that could turn the tide so that we can avoid the worst climate impacts. Those measures are and will be taken under the Paris Agreement, which has been ratified by 191 countries and came into force on November 4, 2016. The Paris Agreement, which I helped negotiate for the Philippines in 2015, and which we also have ratified, can be a game changer if implemented properly. In November 2021, governments will meet in Glasgow, Scotland, in the United Kingdom, for the 26th Conference of the Parties of the Climate Convention to decide how to move forward in implementing the Paris Agreement. And to prepare for that for three weeks in June 2021, climate negotiations were conducted online. The Manila Observatory and the Ateneo de Manila University sent an eight-person delegation, led by me, to monitor and participate in these virtual negotiations. And if the pandemic allows it, we will be present in Glasgow. To influence the climate negotiations, we are working with colleagues all over the world through the Allied for Climate Transformation by 2025 Consortium, or Act 2025, a coalition of organizations led by the Washington DC-based World Resources Institute. Act 2025 will work for just and ambitious outcomes with a view to rebuild trust, foster solidarity, and drive greater climate action on the ground, including amplifying vulnerable voices in order to ensure a prosperous, low-carbon, and climate-resilient future for all. In the Paris Agreement, governments agreed to limit the global average temperature increase to well below 2 centigrade degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. In Paris, both developed and big developing countries resisted the 1.5 target. Five years later, and after the special IPCC report on the impacts of 1.5 in 2018, and with the election of Joe Biden in the United States, that reluctance has dissipated, and the 1.5 target is now the norm together with net neutrality by 2050 to 2060, at least by the big developed and developing countries. But how do we achieve the ambitious global target? Because we are far from that. To global cooperation and national action, with the private sector and especially the carbon majors taking responsibility in radically cutting their emissions. And of course, with the participation of indigenous peoples and local communities. Let's go now to the Philippines and what we can contribute to win against climate change. Obviously, the stakes are very high for us because we are one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. The Philippines will be seriously affected by this phenomenon. And while our emissions are not as high as top emitters, like the United States and China, we do emit significantly more than a majority of other developing countries. It is wrong to say that we are a low emitter compared to all countries because we rank between 30th to 40th of the highest emitters with more than 150 countries emitting lower than us. The Philippines must not contribute to our own destruction. Instead, we must contribute to win against climate change. The Paris Agreement frames each country's commitment to achieve the objectives through an instrument called nationally determined contribution. 
These indices must be developed, adapted, and implemented with transparency, accuracy, completeness, comparability, and consistency, environmental integrity, and avoidance of double counting. On April 15, 2021, the Philippines communicated a nationally determined contribution which updated what we submitted in 2015 during the Paris Conference. The new NDC commit us to a projected GHG or greenhouse gas emissions reduction and avoidance of 75%, which is an increase of 5% from the 2015 target, of which 2.71% is unconditional and 72.29% is conditional, meaning to say we will require foreign or developed country assistance for that 72.29%. This represents the country's ambition for greenhouse gas mitigation for the period 2020 to 2030 for the sectors of agriculture, waste, industry, transport, and energy. Unlike in 2015 when it was included, the new nationally determined contribution excludes forestry, frankly, an unexplicable gap. This commitment is referenced against a projected business as usual, cumulative economy wide emission of 3,340.3 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for the same period. Carbon dioxide equivalent is basically all the emissions transformed or translated into carbon emissions. In the 2021 NDC, the Philippines also set 2030 to peak its emissions, which means emissions will no longer increase after that year. Dr. Manny Solis, a senior research fellow on climate change in Manila Observatory, and I have analyzed the updated nationally determined contribution. We welcome it. We appreciate the work, hard work that government has done, but we also identify gaps and suggest ways to strengthen it. First, the positive. For sure, this NDC has excellent premises. Developed through a whole of government and society approach, it upholds the importance of meaningful participation of women, children, youth, persons with diverse sexual orientation and gender diversity, differently abled, indigenous peoples, elderly, local communities, civil society, and faith-based organizations. I've never seen an NDC so inclusive as the Philippines. It also recognizes the indispensable value of inclusion and collaborative participation of local governments in implementing climate actions. And finally, it seeks to enable a market signal to support local and foreign direct green investments, recognizing the private sector as the country's main engine of economic growth and transformation, promoting its full engagement in climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. One task, however, that must be done is to have an updated greenhouse gas inventory. The current NDC is based on 2010 emissions, and obviously much has changed since then. As noted, the 2021 NDC commits a higher mitigation contribution compared to 2015, 5% higher. And it commits to an unconditional GHG reduction as differentiated from what we submitted in 2015, which was wholly conditional on developed country assistance. These are good changes, indeed very good. However, in my view, we are still far too reliant on development assistance than on our own resources. When we get the chance, we should revisit this ratio by better and more systematic integration of climate considerations and interventions in our national and local budgetary processes. We have started doing this a few years, a few years ago through the Climate Public Expenditure and Institutional Review, or CPEIR, a study sponsored by the World Bank. Let's implement the recommendations of that review. We must also review the Climate Change Act, enacted in 2009 and therefore outdated already, the National Framework Strategy on Climate Change and the National Climate Change Action Plan, both adopted 
a decade ago, in 2010 and 2011 respectively, also outdated. Frankly, we must also revisit the idea of making a commission headed by the president as the anchor of our climate change governance system. I'm now of the opinion that we need a department-like entity to lead the response to climate change, an agency with both regulatory implementation mandates while continuing to be tasked with coordination of the effort of all the relevant agencies. Another gap in the NDC is the failure to communicate clearly a baseline in the energy sector, because it's the Philippines' biggest contributor. About 52% of our emissions is from energy. This information is critical in determining the baseline to identify the policies that are likely to have significant effect on greenhouse gas emissions, including their status, duration, impacts, and how these impacts are estimated. For example, it would be good to see ambitious targets that will put us firmly on the path of transitioning our energy system from its reliance on coal-fired power to one anchored on renewable energy. We must not only impose a moratorium on unapproved new coal projects, but not build those already approved and have a decommissioning plan for older plants. Our banks must follow the example of the Asian Development Bank and once and for all stop financing coal-fired power plants. Lawyers might also want to initiate climate litigation to hasten the energy transition. We have especially an opportunity to do this as we exit from the pandemic to build better. Surprisingly, the NVC drops the forest sector to meet the country's mitigation commitment. In special report on climate change and land, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has identified forestry and other land use activities as a significant net source of GHG emissions. It is widely accepted as important sinks that can absorb carbon. Also, there are many land and forest-related climate change mitigation options that have co-benefits for climate change adaptation. Indeed, indigenous peoples and local communities could benefit from well-designed programs that have their free and prior informed consent. Without the forest sector, the Philippine NDC is weakened. And this absence robs that sector an opportunity to attract climate finance to support forest mitigation and adaptation programs. Lumad schools, for example, in Mindanao, which the current government has been red-tagging and trying to crush out of imagined fears and false premises, could be supported through climate finance for forest activities. Climate finance could also support the Masungi Geo Reserve, a wonderful center of biodiversity in the Marikina watershed that is critical for Metro Manila. Masungi is under constant attack by commercial interests such as quarrying and land development. We can use climate finance to have an alternative vision for the Kaliwa River in the Sierra Madre, which in the guise of supplying water for Manila will be destroyed by development aggression. Forestry's exclusion from the NDC is unfortunate and should be revisited. We'll have talked mainly about mitigation. I must also emphasize that the Philippines, to win against climate change, must also implement adaptation measures. With University of the Philippine colleagues, Christopher Berse, Juan Pulhin, and Mi Canizal, we have identified seven priority actions to manage the climate emergency in the Philippines. These are mainstreaming nature-based solutions, integrated natural resources and environmental management, building safer, dur durable evacuation centers, promoting interagency collaboration for early warning and, and response, promoting inter-LGU cooperation, establishing a national disaster risk reduction agency, and declaring a climate emergency so these things are all prioritized. It goes without saying that basic principles of human rights, as I said in my first lecture, including ensuring a just transition for the poor and disadvantage like indigenous peoples, workers, farmers, urban poor and fisher folk, as well as women and children, 
must guide the implementation of both mitigation and adaptation measures, as well as integrated ones. All the time, we must think and act global and act and think national and local as well. And so, I end this lecture, and as I did in my first magisterial lecture on climate justice, I end with a prayer Pope Francis composed and suggested for us in Laudato Si. A prayer for our earth. All-powerful God, you're present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Thank you.